<clears throat> hey, John, can you test your, your audio? Testing, can you hear me? I don't hear you yet. Um, can you hear me now? Testing, one, two, three. Yes, there we go. Cool. All right. How you been, Marco? I'm in. The, I'm okay. I'm in a strange mood, though. Uh, maybe we'll explore it. I'm. I'm sort of transitioning from. Uh, more, shall we say, womb-like space, a more kind of interiorly focused space into um, a being in the open uh, and a being in public uh, and a being with others, uh, okay. which which uh, we're about to, we're, we're actually doing uh, right now. Yes, indeed. So, we yeah. So, I, I, I've been feeling awkward and I've been feeling... I don't know. I'm comfortable in my own skin, I guess. Uh, awkward about what? Um, just awkward kind of just physically, like in, in the way that a duckling might walk awkwardly. I'm, I'm feeling like an ugly duckling, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> and what does ugly duckling want to have happen? <laughs> oh. oh, I don't know. <laughs> just to, just to uh, keep, just to keep, Keep trundling, trundling along, trundling and al eventually finding my legs. I, I'm sure that I will. Finding your legs, cool. Um, well, what I was hoping to do today is very ambitious, um, so I'm going to play it as it lays. Um, and I know we have some more people coming on in a few minutes. Uh, I, I hope expect. that. We do. Okay. Uh, I did not see their final confirmation, although they confirmed a couple of weeks ago. Well, whoever shows up, we'll work with, okay? Uh, I wanted okay. to, um, you and I have already done some of this symbolic modeling, clean language, so you're familiar with the philosophy behind it. And I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview about, um, well, well we're, we're working on writing at our best. We're all writers here, we're communicators, and, I believe you and Caroline and Ed are very good communicators, and that's why I'm really pleased that we could all get together and do this. Um, but if they don't show up, that's cool, because you and I can still work. And mm -hmm. I, I'm wanting to, I'm, and I'll explain to the group what it is exactly that I want to, uh, uh, what I want to have happen by doing all this. And I wanted to make a few introductory remarks, and then um, just go right into the process, which I think would take. Each, each of you, I'm going to ask some clean questions. Um, each of you would be about 10 minutes. And then, um, it looks like Ed is here. And then um, I wanted, so I, I, would, I would expect it would take about 50 minutes in total for the experiential part, and then we'd have plenty of time to talk. Okay. And maybe go into a meta sort of perspective on this. Okay. That's, a, that's okay with well, you? Whatever you want to have happen before that is cool. If you want to do a little talk amongst ourselves or have a little open frame, it's great too. Uh, well, but before we even get to that, I want to address an audio quality issue. Uh, and it's not the sound of your voice. I'm just kind of hearing it with a lag. And so it's not matching up to your face, which is a oh. little bit disturbing. <laughs> okay. uh, and while we're here, maybe, maybe I should hear what Ed has to say. He's... Uh, and see uh, if it's on your end or if it's on my end, because if I hear it from Ed as well, it's probably on my end. Okay, then I can do the old uh, test one, two, three, test one, two, three. How am I coming across? Is this okay with you? Okay, so that's similar to John. Okay. Um, I can hear him fine. You, I can hear you, both of you, fine. Yeah, okay. I, I think I know what I need to do. I'm going to uh, adjust the setting on my end, and then I'll come back. Yeah, because John's uh, sinking very well here. Uh, it's not like watching a Japanese movie. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love those Godzilla films. Yeah. I, I love them too. Those old Godzilla movies. Those yeah. are great. <laughs> yeah. 
trying to adjust this so I don't have to lean too far. Okay. I had a wonderful dream last night. Yeah, you know, I, I find that so hard to believe, John. <laughs> I didn't. I, I, I was afraid I wasn't going to sleep well because I was really excited about this call. You know how you sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Love, um, but I did. I managed to go into a really nice and had a wonderful, uh, very important dream. So I felt, oh, this is really cool. That, that's good. I'm so a, I, I'm I, have to, I have to work on things like that, John. I've never had a dream in my life that wasn't a nightmare. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. You're no. kidding. No. <laughs> Real? Is that for real? Wow. That is for real, oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. an amazing accomplishment. <laughs> well, here, here's, here's the interesting thing. You're writing them down. No, I'm not writing them down. They're too, they're, too, they're awful. But um, the thing that I find very interesting is uh, my oldest daughter is the same way. Wow. <laughs> I used no. to do a lot of, have to do a lot of work with her when she was young because of that. But uh, I, I, I've, I've come to, to deal with them, but they, they are all, they are all nightmarish. Wow. So that's why when you, when you tell stories about, oh, I had this really great dream last night, I love listening to them but be, for that very reason. It's like, oh, okay, so this is, you know, this is like the other end of the spectrum. There's possibilities. There's still hope, you know. <laughs> there is still hope. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, hi, Caroline. Japanese movie has started. <laughs> hey, Caroline. Hi. Could you test your mic for us? Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, I'd like to hear Faint. you better. Yeah. Faint. Mm. Mm, yeah. Technology. Maybe your um, input settings. How's this? Is that better? No. I just switched. Okay, let me try this. How's this? That's okay. nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we're all here. Yeah. And I've got the audio fixed on my end. And I have no particular introductory remarks to make. In fact, I've just been sitting here in front of my computer, as I was telling John earlier, feeling kind of awkward and like uncomfortable in my own skin. Uh, and at the same time, having a sort of communion with the, my technological rig here. And, I, and, and then I started thinking about how maybe like part of my problem is I need to become more intimate with my technology and actually feel like at home with it instead of feeling a, you know, a bit kind of alienated or hostile uh, toward it or, front, or feeling ho a, ho a sense of hostility from it. Uh, and I, I don't know if you can see here, but I have a microphone uh, and... Of course, I have the screen and my desktop, and there's a whole environment. Uh, uh, which I've seen your desktop, Marco. It's worse than my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were talking about nightmares. Uh, actually, it's a very nice space, and, and I've, t I've taken some time in the last few days to clean it up. I finally yeah, okay. got around to my spring cleaning, uh, oh, okay. although we're just starting summer. I, I washed the windows. I squeegeed them and uh, the works, and I haven't yet lined up my books that that's the only thing that that's <laughs> remaining um and uh so i think uh, uh i think that whatever awkwardness i feel will probably evaporate away in the in the light of of your all br of y'all's brilliance well you know i think a little stage fright is actually healthy i might change my mind about that but <laughs> i always <laughs> stage fright every time i go on stage i always feel a little bit of a uh oh I'm something's yeah. you know, and I forget my lines or whatever and I think or if you have to make a speech or whatever or do a presentation yeah. like this one and mm -hmm. I, I I think that can turn into excitement um, mm -hmm. so I'm all for it I know Lawrence Olivier yeah. said uh, if you weren't a little scared before you go out on stage you're gonna fuck up really bad yeah. <laughs> You're the wise man John a wise man I can tell you <laughs> but you know this is a safe to fail experiment as mm -hmm. we've talked about and this is all about peer-to-peer -peer learning um, I have a few remarks that I've sort of uh, worked on, okay. and then I wanted to open it up to you guys and, uh, you know, invite you to ask me any questions about me or about this process. And um, then we can 
do the process. I imagine it'll take about 45 minutes for all three of us, um, Caroline, Ed, and Marco. And um, it'll be about a, a 10 minute modeling. Pro I'll, I'll model you, I'll ask you clean language questions for about 10 minutes. Then I'm gonna ask you to represent that, a diagram or a drawing or a picture. So if you have, uh, you know, pencil and paper or pen and paper, crayons if you want, that would be great. And then while one person is drawing or making a representation, I'm going to go to the next person, ask them a few clean language questions, then ask them to uh, make a map or draw or diagram it. And so I'm gonna go like around. And then, then once I've completed the three of your, your interviews, each of you can show your uh, diagram, drawing, map, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and then we can go into what I would call the, the leg different levels. Um, so we're gonna be working with metaphor, um, analogy, um, story, if that happens. And I'm interested in modeling. Um, and I believe all of you are very good communicators. I followed you, uh, your conversations and your written communication. So I believe you are all uh, very good. And so that's why I'm really enjoying this opportunity to work with people who, who if not expert or at least very competent or proficient in this in the skill of writing and i um hope that when we finish this process we can maybe go to a, a meta level and sort of uh, look at this as a as one model among other models uh, that we've been exploring here and um you know uh, i would invite uh, some feedback about what you liked what you didn't like what would you what you would like more of um so uh that's the plan Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any questions for me or about the process? You do? Okay, Marco. Uh, uh, when you're going around and huh. interviewing each of us individually, and then we each go off to write or represent mm -hmm. what we just, what, you know, what arises. I would prefer you to do a picture or okay. a drawing rather than write. But if you want to do it, it's okay. I'll, I'll explain that why that's important. But go uh, ahead. Would, would we at that time want to? Um, mute our headphones or it wouldn't be necessary arm. it wouldn't be necessary you okay. could do it right at the desk where you are and you could just be doing your drawing and and uh, while I'm doing the next interview and if you lit it's if you if you're going to be bothered by the conversation you can mute yourself but we're only going to be I would I would expect it would take two or three minutes or maybe five to do a sketch um, if you get really artistic and want to go further that's cool too um, I just, for the purpose of this particular uh, exercise that we're doing, um, I just want to time it so that uh, it, it, one of the intentions actually is when you're hearing another person interviewed, there will be things that uh, you'll be listening. I'm going to be paying attention to patterns mm. and be looking for patterns. And what I thought was fascinating about this possibility of co-modeling together um you would each of you would get to become an observer participant you would be able to observe another's process you would also be able to participate in your own process and i believe that could really be an accelerated learning opportunity for all of us uh, so there's something valuable about when you are listening and listening to your listening um, while i'm interviewing uh, one of our, your colleagues here um, and once again, when you're in observer mode, you can think about, I like this, I don't like this, what I want more of. Um, you can, um, I, one of the fascinating things to me, I hope I answered your question, did Absolutely, I? Absolutely, yes. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. um, one of the fascinating things, are we recording? Are we on now? We're on, we're live. Oh, okay. Yep. okay. Uh, one of the things that fascinated me in some of our conversations online, uh, we talked about the, um, third level, or I did, I mentioned um, the third wave of cybernetics. Um, and we were talking, I think, about the post-human, and it's a very fascinating subject. And my own personal interest in this I, um, was uh, the Palo Alto group in California. They started the first wave, really, back in the 50s. And they were studying family systems. And I thought this was very fascinating that they set up a situation where there was a 
one-way mirror and the family was on one side and the experts were on the other side of that mirror. The experts could see the assist the family, but the family could not see them. And inside of the conference room with the family, there was a telephone and there was a therapist. So they would observe the family, they would take notes, they would create an intervention, they would phone it in, and the therapist would take the message and then deliver the intervention to the family. But someone had a very brilliant idea. This sounds pretty much like typical, you know, top-down management style. But someone had the brilliant idea that maybe we should just, all of us get in one room together and see what happens. So the, the experts got in the same room with the family system and all hell broke loose. It was chaos. The whole observer stance that had been achieved by the one-way mirror, of course, disappeared because the family could then make comments about the interventions of the uh, experts. So we're moving from a first level, a first wave of, of systems theory to a second wave. So we're looking at how obs the observer maintaining that uh, subject object stance is broken down uh, when you enter into the room. And then, then I think what, there was a lot of work at, at the first wave and at the second wave. And now I think we're starting to uh, emerge out of a, into a third wave. Uh, I think this is where a lot of post-humanism and transhumanism comes from, uh, because it's not just uh, you're, you're the observer and the observed are over there. That's broken down. So now we're participant observers. That's the second wave. The third wave is when we, when we're now studying the behaviors of complex adaptive systems and sometimes uh, chaotic systems. Um, and in the third wave, I think it's uh, much more challenging the kind of uh, dynamics. Um, and I believe we're starting to model this. And I believe that this exercise that we're doing is sort of uh, an attempt at, at doing third wave cybernetics because each of us is a uh, observer and a participant. And we're going to be observing and participating with uh, different people here. And we're all working with a certain skill or a particular passion that we all have, which is writing. And I'm, I'm imagining that meta space that could be achieved by this could teach us a lot about uh, how far away or maybe how close we are to the, the third wave. Or maybe we can create the third wave here, who knows? So I hope that was, uh, did, did that, I, I would welcome any response if, or any questions. If I understand you correctly, first okay. wave is observer, uh, sub, you know, subject object outside, not participating. Second yeah. wave is a participant type observer. Third yes. wave is a, per, a perspective on the process itself and the systemic interconnections between that process and perhaps between, other processes. Between multiple uh, systems. Indeed. Behaviors of multiple systems. And so, so we're, we're occupying... We're talking about animals. We're talking about plants. We're talking about humans. We're talking about non-humans. All of these complex systems have behaviors, and um, so I think that's a. I think that's what the uh, Catherine Hales, who's a systems theorist I greatly admire, has written a lot on posthumanism, and she's talking about this third wave. She's the one who's tracking this uh, new wave that she believes is, is emerging out of those previous waves. Okay, how will we know if we if we uh, arrive at the third wave? I don't know. I don't have, a, I'm not sure that that's a very good question. And I hope, you, and I'll remember that. Um, also, this came out of my, uh, I was listening to you and Caroline talk about, and I think you were talking about Caroline, um, Francisco Varela and Maturana. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so you're familiar with these ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought you would enjoy this uh, quote. Where did I, I wrote it down here somewhere. Um, I think the, uh, uh, I think it was Maturana or maybe it was Varela. Um, these were two very important theorists who, who were in, involved, I think, in all of these, the first two waves and third as well. Um, I think it was Maturana who said, every observation is made by someone. 
which seems pretty obvious, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I think it was um, Von Forrester or someone else, I don't know, uh, some of the theorists came along and added another axiom. He said, every observation is told to someone. So you have an observer, you have uh, someone you're communicating to, and you have a code, language. Um, that I think is the, the first and second level. Um, I think the third level comes in when we're dealing with a lot of nonverbals, when we're dealing with non-human intelligences, non-human systems. And, uh, and we are challenged because many of us are feeling called upon to speak on their behalf. So we have to use our imaginations in ways that are, I think it's a little bit of the new and the old. I believe humans have been communicating and have been very intimate with non-human intelligences for a very long time. So I'm, that's part of my interest and, and my fascination with modeling, because I'm hoping to just, get, I'm just hoping to get my skill level a little bit up there. I'm, I would consider myself a competent modeler. I would like to get proficient. Someday I'll be an expert. Um, just to let you know, that's my own self-assessment. So, um, but we all are experts at being ourselves, right? So everyone has some expertise somewhere. I was uh, just sharing that with you because I thought that would be of general interest to a lot of the conversations we've been having. I don't always feel that way. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> oh, I feel like quite the oh, novice. Quite oh, novice. that's good. That's a very good sign, though. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Uh, I think I shared that with you, the Hubert Dreyfus material, because mm -hmm. he looked at um, uh, novice, beginner, um, competent, proficient, expert, and that there are, state, there are levels between, and you can know what those levels are. And that is very important as you start to learn something else, totally different, that you've gone through those stages and you've reached a level of expertise, then you can um, replicate that, or it can help you organize your behavior around another skill that you want to develop. So I think this is very important for me personally, because I learn new things, like riding a bike in New York, something recently I tried, tried out, and I was really terrified. I had a real phobia about it. But uh, that was about a month ago, and now I feel great. I'm whizzing in and out of trucks and, and you know, uh, taking huge risks. Mm -hmm. Nothing, I'm doing just fine, you know. <laughs> but uh, I'm just like letting you know. So in a way, I'm learning how to uh, ride a bike again because I had never uh, ridden a bike in, in Manhattan, although I've lived here for many years. So I'm just letting you know, guys, where I'm, where I'm going with this um, because I know not everyone's familiar with clean language or symbolic modeling, but I hope at the end of this, um, session today, you'll have a really good idea about um, what, which of these ideas, if any of them, are going to be useful for you um, and useful for our group. So the group dynamic here is fascinating for me because we all have personal excellence, perhaps, in some ways, uh, and our personal development is important to us. But also, I think what you're, you're offering, uh, Caroline and Marco and Ed, you're, you're sponsoring, another, uh, I think, another aspect of our uh, group learning. Um, so anyway, I've said enough. Uh, is there anything you want to ask me or, or do you want to go right into this process? Or how do you feel? What happens next? Shall we go with you, Marco, first? Um, um, is, it, who's, is there a dog? Is that your dog, Caroline, by the way? <laughs> No, that's my backyard. Oh, no, that's, oh, that's okay. Yeah. The driving and train. You, you may hear a train behind in in the background coming from my end. I, I hear it down the tracks right now. It's it's honking its horn a little bit. So, well, I'm going to keep track of our time as best I can. Um, I just wanted to briefly um, a little poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins, which I believe is relevant to our adventure here today. Um, Hopkins, when a very young man, saw a rainbow. In writing of it, Hopkins captured the problem of emergence in cognition. And emergence is a key word here. It was a hard thing to undo this knot. The rainbow shines, but only in the thought of him that looks. Yet not in that alone, for who makes rainbows by invention? And many standing round a waterfall see one bow each, yet not the same at all. 
but each a hand's breadth further than the next. The sun on falling waters writes the text, which yet is in the eye or in the thought. It was a hard thing to undo this knot. I think that's so relevant because Hopkins is trying to locate this rainbow. Is it in the rain, in the sunlight, in the waterfall, in his eye, in his mind? So, so I think that is a, a lovely poem about this human dilemma and this, uh, the dilemma that many writers have. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in exploring what is a pattern, um, you know, what repeats itself, that repeats itself in a way that's distinctive enough to call it a pattern, and how we're moving from a very quantitative deficient science, as the Absarians were known, were aware of this, and how are we going to move from a science of quantity and measurement to a science of quality? Um, I believe it's possible, desirable. Some have already done this. Um, but I think the, um, that's what metaphor and analogy and story, they're, I'm looking for qualities. Does it have a size or shape? Whereabouts is that in your perceptual space? Can you put your hand on that? And then once you locate it in a perceptual space, it's here, it's over there, you can then start to ask questions that are clean. The intention here is not to add a layer of interpretation on it so that what comes up can then become clear as a pattern or a meta pattern or some way that this person's, their internal process, how they're putting something together to make sense. So that anyway, um, so that's my, my desired outcome really, is to make this enjoyable for everyone feel safe, secure, and uh, let it happen, let it rip. Um, if um, anyone wants to ask me a, a question before we start, I'm open to that, or about this process. Hello, anybody? No, go for it. Okay, let's go for it. Um, okay, Marco, I'll start with you first. Um, and I'm going to write, I'm going to be taking notes. And when writing at your best, that's like what? It's like dreaming. Ah, like dreaming. And when like dreaming, what kind of dreaming? Like lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming. And when lucid dreaming, is there anything else about lucid? When lucid dreaming, there is a transparency to my awareness when I'm lucid dreaming. And a transparency. And when a transparency to your dreaming, when lucid dreaming, where does that transparency come from? That transparency comes from my heart. And whereabouts in your heart? From all around my heart. From all around your heart. And when that transparency comes from your heart and all around your heart, then what happens? Then I write in a delightful manner, in a manner that delights me and that I feel will delight others as well. And in a manner that delights you and delights others as well. That I feel will delight others as well. And when write when you write and delights me 
What kind of me is that me? When delights me. It's a happy me. It's a, an imaginative me. Uh, a mischievous, perhaps, sometimes, me. A serious me as well, a very serious me. And what determines mischievousness from serious me? That's a, I don't I don't know exactly how to answer that question. Other than that, it has something to do with the play of it, and something to do with the transparency of it. The play of it and the transparency of it, and in the play of it and the transparency of it, and the happy me, and imaginative and mischievous and serious me. What happens to is there a relationship between all of that and lucid dreaming? In lucid dreaming, as in writing, uh, things happen one after the next. And situations, scenes, intimations, scenarios, ideas all arise spontaneously uh, however in a in, in a way that I allow and that I am somehow positioned as uh, the the one with the pen or the one at the keyboard uh, to translate uh, into words that could be expressed or communicated uh, with others and Situations arising, scenarios will arise spontaneously in a way that you allow as the one with pen or keyboard and translate. And is that a good place for us to pause? I think so. Uh, I think we've gone about almost 10 minutes. So now it was your, t if you would like do a map or a drawing or a diagram. Mm hmm is, that, is this okay with you? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go to Caroline. Caroline, can I go with you? Or Ed, you, yes. do you have a friend? Okay. Either one. <laughs> so you, you've uh, been an observer, so you sort of got the idea of what I'm going uh, to I'm going to be asking you probably different questions, but they'll all be clean questions. Um, and when writing at your best... That's like what? Flow. <laughs> it's like flow. Flow. What kind of flow? Um, a channeling, a communion with consciousness. A channeling. Communion with consciousness. And when a channeling and a communion with consciousness, is there anything else about communion? Communion. Um, it's like communicating almost with, um, with, my ability to sense make <laughs> and others as well abilities to sense make um, the their experiences and when ability to sense make and communicating then what happens to communion there's an exhilaration of of getting it right or of saying it the right way or of saying something that resonates. And it's what's so pleasurable about writing at my best. 
and and exhilaration of getting it right and so pleasurable and when so pleasurable whereabouts is so pleasurable in in the center of my torso <laughs> oh. and the um, between the the pelvis all the way to the heart it varies and from the center of your pelvis to the heart mm -hmm. and it varies and when center of, of the pelvis to the heart and so pleasurable then what happens I try to keep writing. <laughs> I try to write until there's quiet or until there's no energy for writing. And then when I read back through it, either immediately or much later, if I feel that pleasure again, then, and I feel that, that, uh, kind of being taken on a journey again, then I know that it was that it was uh, true or good or whatever. <laughs> and you keep writing until quiet. Mm -hmm. And then the pleasure and taken on a journey. Mm -hmm. And when quiet, when writing till quiet, whereabouts is that quiet? It's on the inside or the outside? Does it have a size or it's, shape? It's, it's uh, saturated everywhere. Not just me, but outside of me. Mm. It's just like a trance breaking almost. Just um, suddenly I'm looking down at a pen and paper <laughs> instead of whereas moments before I was in it, you know. And, and saturated. And did mm -hmm. you see trance breaking? It, yeah, similar to that where you kind of blink and uh, look around and you're like, oh, what? Yeah. And is there a relationship between that saturated quiet and pleasure? Mm. Pleasure um, is connected with the communion aspect of riding like riding a wave that isn't my own doing or isn't you know volitional on the part of my ego i guess or conscious mind or whatever my personality um but just like almost like trying to satisfy the this communal voice like saying the right thing if i can just say that you know really figure out what i what i or we is thinking and say it, it will please uh, everybody <laughs> and I and we are thinking and please everybody and riding away mm -hmm. and when riding a wave what happens to flow that's that's the, the flow the right the wave is inside and and the flow so the sense of flow from the inside is the riding of the wave which is which is uh, interior Um, is this a good time for us to pause? Sure. Uh, I feel like you got a lot of a lot of material there. Is mm -hmm. this a, you feel comfortable doing a, like a drawing or diagram? Great. Yes. Thank you. And while you're doing that, I'm going to work with Ed. All right. Go for it. Okay, Ed. And when writing at your best, that's like what? That's like being in the groove. Being in the groove. Being in the groove. And when being in the groove, what kind of groove is that groove? Well, it's very harmonious. You know, it's it's kind of musical. It's got. Uh, it's, it seems to resonate well with inside and outside. And harmonious and kind of musical and resonates well with the yeah. inside and the outside. Yeah. And when 
being in the groove and harmonious and musical and resonates well with the inside and the outside, whereabouts is resonating? It's pretty all, it's actually very all encompassing. It's kind of like I'm in tune with, with, with the world or my surroundings or. And all encompassing. Yeah. Yeah. And in tune. In tune. Yeah. With your world and your surroundings. Yeah. And when you're in tune, how do you know you're in tune? Um, it, it it resonates harmonically with you know it's kind of like it's it's like listening to music mm-hmm. and you know when that when the harmony's right and you also know when it's when it's not yeah. and listening to music when the harmony is right yeah. and when listening to the music and the harmony is right then what happens I, I, I can keep grooving. <laughs> it's kind of self-perpetuating. And you can, and you can keep grooving. And yeah. when keep grooving, where does grooving come from? Oh, that's one of the things I wish I knew <laughs> where it comes from. It's, uh, it's a, that's one of the mysteries for me, that, that sometimes it can seem so right, and other times... I can't seem to find it. And a mystery for you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it feels right and sometimes you can't find it. And when a mystery, does mystery have a size or a shape? No, mystery is kind of big too. It's kind of like that all-encompassing thing. And and big and all-encompassing. Yeah, yeah. It's very, it's kind of universal. And universal. Yeah. And can you show it? Could could you show me with your hand where this universal is? Is it on the inside or the outside, or it has? No, it's 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 inside and outside. It's 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 uh, it's universal. <laughs> it's like, it's really like you're in tune with all of the cosmos, kind uh-huh. of thing. And when where does where does Tune in the cosmos. Where does that come from, or what happens next? Usually, it ends up getting uh, unharmonic or disresonant, and I'll lose my place, or life will impinge, or I'll get called to do something or whatever, and and then it, it kind of breaks. You know, the, so it kind of breaks, and uh, you lose your place, and it's unharmonic, and what would you like to have happen? Most, most of the time, I'd like it to go on until I realize what it is I, I've been called to do or need to do and realize it's probably a good thing that I get a break. It's easy to get kind of like taken up in the cosmos, if you will. But um, it's nice to have a break. And when taken up in the cosmos, and it's nice to have a break... What happens to being in the groove? It, it's a very pleasant memory that I hope I'm going to get back to soon. Great. Thank you. Okay. It's a good time to pause. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Would you, uh, so you got. I'll give, so give it a shot. Make a drawing or, a, or a, you know, some sort of diagram or a sketch. Yeah. I'll give it a shot. Thank you. <laughs> And now I'm going to go back to Marco while you're doing that, while Carolyn's working on hers. And are you ready now, Marco, to sh- discuss your drawing or maybe even show it to us if you, if you feel comfortable doing that? I can, yes. Uh, I should preface it by saying that I uh, consider uh, – I don't draw. I don't practice drawing. <laughs> There's fun in every group that says that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said you can do a model or a, a map. Uh, I, my, my, in terms of my skill level, my competence level, where I would be on that, on the scale of expertise, it'd be very low, very, very low. Uh, 
preschool level would, would probably be um, a more or less accurate designation for my capacity, skills, and talents as a visual artist, as a drawer. However, uh, in the spirit of participation and observation uh, and meta-observation, I let myself just kind of draw free form, free, just really letting myself doodle. Uh, more pro- more properly, this would be called a doodle. Uh, and this is in a no- this is in my notebook. I'll show you the notebook too. So this is my notebook. And so I, I do write in here. Uh, I think though, I may want to get a notebook without lines in it, and m- move away from the lines. Uh, although lines are useful when sort of composing linearly, which I. I, I think I end up doing in the notebook and then I end up inadvertently just switching out of linear mode and going into a more spacious sort of associative mode. And so the drawing is taking that to another dimension actually. And so that's what I sort of was wow. drawing or doodling. Uh, wow. Okay. Can you translate that for us? I'll try. I should mention that there's some notes here that I took previously uh-huh. Uh, which uh, are unrelated to our, our present conversation, um, but they may be related if I think about it to the drawing because I was noticing that they were there as I was drawing. And uh, well, I started with this circular shape over here and then I, wa- I felt that it wanted to radiate outwards. And so I ended up with these sort of ripples of, um, of energy coming out of that, of that circle and then I think I began imagining uh, the channels or the veins or the sort of feeding uh, the roots, the, the ways that um, inspiration or uh, image, vision, idea sort of rises out of uh, a depth or out of uh, obscurity or darkness. And so that's what these kind of became is these roots. Uh, and then I felt like drawing a, a dark black circle. Uh, as uh, a sort of all-purpose enigma and stuck that up here uh, toward the place where a sun might be. So it's kind of a black sun or perhaps it's a black moon. Uh, And then I started filling in some geometric shapes and other sort of elements that occurred to me associatively. And so that's where these triangles came from, which were sort of pyramidic and um, perspectival. They, They kind of created this sense of perspective because they were receding into the background uh and uh and then i started conceiving what was inside of that originary circle at the beginning which i guess you know now in retrospect as i'm looking back on it i wasn't planning this i wasn't really i, I didn't have a a kind of discursive process going on as i was writing uh i started seeing it as a, a an embryo or as a um an egg uh then as an eyeball uh, and then I thought it would be better to have a reptilian eyeball than a mammalian one. And so uh, I, I created this, I guess, almost vulvic type of um, shape within it. And then that became a, a, a sort of fetal uh, figure uh, with this, this entity over here who kind of looks like a man. He might be kind of flowing off into some kind of umbilical or some kind of a an artery. Uh, and yeah, well, I just kept going. <laughs> really, I, and it's funny because I was here overhearing, I wasn't really listening, but I was overhearing what uh, your conversation with Caroline and Ed. And, and I, I also I felt like they were almost just flowing into it in some way, like that without trying, really, I wasn't really trying to incorporate or integrate or anything like that. The, I would just hear things that that seemed to resonate with what I was drawing, and and that let I let my hand move accordingly. And you let your hand move accordingly. Yeah. And there's channels. There's a cir- circular and radiate and ripples of energy and roots and dark black circle. I should All mention this this spear coming across here. It's sort of uh, almost like a barbed. Um, surface uh, which felt uh, like it needed to be there it felt like there needed to be some kind of jaggedness some kind of uh, maybe defensive perimeter and it's it's also splitting 
the two sides of the page, the, the top where I had previously been writing from, from the bottom. But it's also, it's, it's, uh, it's a kind of briar patch, uh, I think. And it does have a, a, a looming presence over everything, although it's not absolute. It, it, it dissipates into a straight line going across and there's space around it. So one can move, I think, between the two sides of this particular obstruction. And you can move on either side of this particular obstruction, this spear, this briar patch, and enigma, all-purpose enigma, the black circle, and the, per, the originating circle, and the triangle, perspectival, and the reptilian eyeball, the embryo, the egg, and moving, Let's see, you said moving above and moving below that line, that briar patch, that yeah. spear. Yeah. And with all of that, what are you most drawn to? <laughs> I think I'm drawn to the briar patch, actually. Ah. Uh, which, which word, by the way, I, I realize where it's coming from. Uh, and I don't think I've actually uh, uh, seen, I don't know if I'd be able to recognize a briar patch in the wild, uh, but it's from a text uh, by Albert Murray, who we were talking about last week. Uh, and uh, it's one of the ways that, one of the metaphors that he uses for the blues is like being inside of a briar patch. Like, you know, it's, it's pokey, it's raspy, it's uh, uh, scratchy, it, it's not comfortable, uh, but you, you sing and you write anyway. And thank you very much. And what kind of, now that we know, have a lot more information, all of us about Marco's process and writing what it's like for him when he writes at its best. Marco, what kind of environment allows you to write at your best? Uh, this studio right here, <laughs> this space uh, seems to allow me to write pretty well. And what environment prevents you from writing at your best? The coffee shop down the street with the bad music and the obnoxious conversations. The coffee shop and the bad music and <laughs> obnoxious conversations. Okay. What kind of behaviors or activities allow you to write at your best? Meditation, walking, especially walking. When I'm writing well, I go for a walk and words come to me and I'll stop and write them down in my notebook. And meditation and walking and you stop and write them down. Mm -hmm. And what skills or abilities allow you to write at your best? Intense listening, uh, intensive focus of, of my ear on uh, an interior feeling or some clue, some, uh, thread that I'm following. Intensive listening and interior feeling and thread that you're following. And when writing at your best, what's important to you? Important to me is completion completion is a completion of a movement i'm, I'm feel, uh, one of the things i overheard was caroline's um saying the mentioning that the quietness comes there's a quietness and that something doesn't need to be said or want to be said anymore you, you've sort of completed it uh at least that's how i heard it and interpreted it and that quietness is a is a sense of there's there's a bit of an afterglow there's a bit of a of a emptying or satiation an emptying and satiation mm -hmm. and a completion of movement yeah and when you're writing at your best and completion of movement satiation who are you That's a hard one to say. 
I'm perhaps like the bus driver in your in the dream that you wrote about in the forum, John. I don't have an identity. And when you look at me, I'm a cubist painting with multiple eyes and angles. And you wonder where we're going on this bus. <laughs> and when you're on a when you're a bus driver, no identity and look like a cubist painting. What is your relationship to others? I, I think I, I may be amusing and thought, potentially thought provoking if one's so inclined. <laughs> amusing and thought provoking. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. And um, I would like to um, go to Caroline next, if that's okay with you, Caroline. Now that you got it, mm-hmm. now that all of you have seen Marco's process, this is uh, the end of it. So we, but it's also a new beginning because I suspect something has happened and you can start to reorganize around what you've learned about yourself at whatever level that is. And uh, I, after we uh, gather all the data here from Caroline and from Ed, I would like to then do a little meta, take a little meta perspective on the process because already I noticed, Marco, that you were borrowing from others, from the quiet, from Caroline, uh, you, my own dream that I posted, you responded to, and also you mentioned Albert Murray, the interview in the Briar Patch. So you're already resonating, I think, with that's my metaphor. You mm-hmm. get you get my drift. Mm-hmm. So um, are you ready, Caroline? Yes. Oh, by the and way, we're at, we're at 2.51. We've almost been 50 minutes. So we have another 20 minutes to half an hour. Is that okay mm-hmm. with everybody? Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, sorry, Caroline. Ready. Oh, thank you for checking in. Um, uh, yeah, I also borrowed from other people's uh, content in my own illustration. <laughs> I'm also not not an illustrator, but um, yeah. So it started with. Let's see. Let me get up close and see if you can see what what I'm seeing. It started with this, and there was that sense of resonance in the middle of the body, like we talked about. And it, there's there's an audience here, but and it's not just people. There's other beings too in the audience, but they're not um, immediately present. In fact, when I was thinking about your uh, questions you were posing to Marco and what spaces are conducive to me writing at my best, socializing or being in social direct perception is not conducive like I don't I want to be alone and actually have nonverbal communion on some level but there's that sense of discovery and exploration of if I'm if I'm saying am I am I am I saying this quite right and then there's a feedback there's a kind of feedback where the consciousness or we or I just feel like yes that's right and so I almost would consider my inner the central channel like an inner guru because, uh, you know, whether I'm actually tapping into collective consciousness or not, um, there's something within me that knows the difference between what's right and wrong. So it almost, too, I, I came up with this image of sculpting. If this is a stone and then as you go, you are bringing out a shape that was innate in it. And the shape that you end up with is the is the piece of art that gives pleasure because it's beautiful and true, but it was there in the stone all along. So there, for me, discovery and uncovering and exploration and digging, there's the gem in the dirt up there because it's like you're digging and you're looking for that. And when you find it, you know you found it. And then down here, what did I draw? Oh, again, the central channel... Um, there's a sense that when you get it right, it twangs like a string and it opens um, and you're less of who you think you are and more of just kind of a, a selfless, you know, um, communion with the universe. And then when it's closed, it's like a shriveled up tight rope that doesn't have any energy or light flowing in any direction up or down it. So um this is when I'm closed off and when I'm preoccupied with thoughts about, you know, whatever that's, and this is when it's twanging and it's saying yes. Ah, <laughs> and when it's twanging and saying yes. Yes. And, and uh, sculpting and shape and innate 
and channel, central channel guru resonates in the middle of the body and the audience, and you want to be alone and feedback. Mm-hmm. And we or I, Jim in dirt. And with all of that, what are you most drawn to? The idea of feedback, actually. The idea that there's something in me that twangs or says yes, or that there's some something that, that lets me know whether what I'm writing is um, apt or is hitting the mark or is is maybe like, maybe I get like 65% of the way there or 80% and I'm just like, well, that's all I can do today. I mean, I just don't know what this needs. But then when I come back, I can find that 100% because I've led myself thus far to the 80% true, you know, state so, or whatever. So 65%, 80%, 100%. Yeah. Right. There's, and yes. The idea that there's something telling me that, that there's a feedback, that's what's remarkable to me, I think. And that's represented in the resonance or vibrational elements of all the illustrations that I did. Um, is it okay if we pause right now? Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'd like to ask you the, uh, the, the le- about the levels. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you're writing at your best, what kind of environment allows you to write at your best? a segregated environment um, in the sense that when I have committed to myself that all I'm going to do for that period of hours or day is focus on bringing something to fruition um, or bringing it, you know, um, further along in writing, then that's conducive. I haven't necessarily found the physical spaces to answer your question that are more or less conducive, but, but that's more of a mental and social confinement or, you know, container that's conducive. Uh, what, well, what, when you're writing at your best, what environment prevents you from writing at your best? Um, I'd say the converse of that. So distracting environments where there's stimulation or outside influences, um, certainly social environments um you know aren't aren't conducive if i'm trying if people are trying to interact with me if i'm observing and writing that's different but if someone's trying to take my attention in terms of social interaction that does not support me to write and what kind of behaviors or activities allow you to write at your best Um, what kind of behaviors or activities allow me to write at my best? Um, I guess carving out that time, like I said, um, just being committed about it and not letting, like turning off phones and everything like that and just being committed. Um, Turning off phones, mm -hmm. carving out time. Yeah, and there's something that's subtle, and I'm not sure how to say it, but it's setting setting any thought of who I think I am aside for for the the whole time if I can. Um, just not being preoccupied with ideas about who I think I am as a personality or whatever, and just um, trying to be through the words and be in the words and with the words and all that. And putting who I am, who you are, aside. Who I think I am. <laughs> who you think. Yeah. Who you think you is about myself. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what skills and abilities allow you to write at your best? <laughs> I struggle with that one because I don't know that I am very good at knowing uh, what it takes to right at my best or, or like developing that, you know, and I'm just feel like a new, a newbie <laughs> at that. Like a newbie. Uh, what, what skills or abilities would you like to have that would allow you to write at your best? I guess, um, having comfort with putting myself, my, putting my work out there, um, and, and asking for feedback and 
receiving like mentorship like those are things that uh, receiving receiving critique um or, or just knowing how to ask i think is the bigger barrier <laughs> um and yeah. knowing how to ask mm -hmm. and comfort mm -hmm. asking for feedback and mentorship mm -hmm. and when writing at your best what is important saying what's true because then i have that emotional sense of release or pleasure yeah and saying what's true and when writing at your best who are you uh who am i i would say uh, a fearless, empty conduit. <laughs> That's who I am. <laughs> a fearless, empty conduit. Yes. And when a fearless, empty conduit, what is your relationship to others? It, that's a really interesting question because it's not a direct or even verbal relationship. It's like a nonverbal, um, you know, truth affirming, like, uh, relationship, I guess, where I feel like if I'm saying what's true, then I'm helping to redeem living beings <laughs> i guess um so my relationships with others is is more of a of a direct subtle tran you know i don't know um nonverbal like uh and in fact i struggle with and i having i don't want i don't i struggle with not wanting to be seen as a writer i struggle with wanting to not be seen <laughs> not be seen and not be seen as a writer. And so um, that's not like being seen as a writer or sharing my works more directly is not a relationship I have with others. It's actually the experience of writing is more like if I can say what's true, then, um, then maybe like we can see ourselves more clearly. Um, but I know that if I just keep that in my journals privately, like that it doesn't help anyone necessarily. So it has mm -hmm. to, I'm working to make that connection, that bridge between that bridge. Saying, saying it and others hearing it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Can we pause? Is this a good time? No. Um, and Ed, you're no. next. And really? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be interviewing Ed. Is everybody okay with the time? Are you over like? Because we're gonna, you know, the time frame here. Because mm -hmm. uh, I'm. Uh, why don't you just paste this correctly for everybody? Okay, so we don't need a break. We could just go right on. All right, and then, then we can uh, take some time to do like uh, evaluation or anything you've learned about yourself or about the group that's useful to you. Okay, so Ed, yes. did you uh, have a sketch or a picture for us? Yes, I, I have a, and, and I know that everybody likes to think that they're the worst artist in the world. But I'm going to take lessons from those other two. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, art phobia, art phobia, right? Okay. Well, it's worth some. Well, I, I have a I've, drawn, so I've I drawn stick figures, and people have asked me, "What is that?" Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the drawing that I drew. I'll try to get it in this in the screen. It looks like it's in the screen as far as I can see. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I see it fine. Okay, and it kind of looks like a big circle, but it's not a circle. It's actually a torus. Marco will know what I'm talking about. And those rays that are going out from it are showing that it, it, it's expanding. Mm -hmm. And in, in this torus kind of thing, there's stars and novas and worlds and galaxies or whatever. That's what those indecipherable squigglings are in there. And I, and I saw those as musical notes in and of themselves. So I kind of have stems and flags on them like music notes would be. And the, the, those lines across the center is not like I'm trying to eliminate the things that are in there. That's kind of like 
the five bars of the staff. This is where the music takes place kind of thing. And down here in the, in the, in the, in the corner, there's a little red uh, lemon isket that's got horns and a smile because that's the, the devilishness of infinity kind of thing. That, <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's supposed to represent. I know it's not really doing the job. Um, but that's, that's basic. Those are basically the elements that are in my, my drawing of how I felt about our little talk. And, and a big circle and a Taurus and rays expanding. Yeah. Stars and novas and galaxies and musical notes. Yeah. And the, the Lemniscate, you called it? Yeah, that's that little infinity thing. Infinity, which is red and it's a devil. Did you say a devil? Yeah, it's kind of like, well, I said imp. You know. imp I beg your pardon. <laughs> my, my mishearing. That's okay. It, there's not a whole, there's not a big difference between them. And, what, and with, with all of that, what are you most attracted to? Um, actually, I'm attracted. The, the thing I like most about my own drawing is the totality of it. Uh-huh. Okay? I mean, the allness of it. That it's... it's the, the things that I wanted to include are all there, I think. The, the totality of it. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. all of you for your participation and your observation. I really enjoyed uh, this process. It was a challenge for me because I was trying to keep track of all of this and be faithful to um, staying in rapport with your unique process. Mm-hmm. And I'm uh, doing it online is is particularly challenging for me. No, I mean, I've done a lot of I've done a lot of workshops yeah. working face to face with people. <laughs> and as you may notice, I like to look at people's bodies and where yeah. they're putting things in their perceptual space. And so uh, there's a lot of verbal and nonverbal um, stuff I'm trying to keep track of. So that's my yeah. challenge as a modeler. And um, and we're all uh, co modeling. I mean, we're co modeling here, and we've all observed and we've participated. And um, I'm just curious if uh, the question I have is what you may have learned about your own process and about the process of the group. So I would just open that up to anyone who wants to share. Or if there's any other questions that come up for you that um, you want to put that on the table, that's great too. Uh, I'll offer that um, it, it- the questions that you posed, um, especially after our drawings, really helped me ask those of myself, and those are never questions I've asked myself or thought about before. And so, um, I think one of the piv- the sticky the sticky points that's also a pivot is um, on ri- writing at your best as a verb instead of when you are when you are a great writer or something like as a noun. <laughs> So, (laughs) because I really struggle with that, as I mentioned. Um, So, yeah. Um, And so it's, it comes down to, for me, like a question of, am I going to honor, um, honor what I took out of this and honor, honor um, the process of writing for in my own life by giving it sufficient space and conditions, you know, that these questions helped uh, elucidate. So, yeah, I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate that you um, that you insisted that we use some of our weaker skills, like drawing, to uh, try to create non-verbal, non-written representations of of what we feel. Yeah, I think one of the the logic behind that is um, when we're very verbal and we're in the verbal mode, and when we have to switch to another mode, there's something that happens in that in between space that is very interesting so um mm-hmm. and then to translate that back into into language is uh, i think where they we, we, we pick up on those patterns and those meta patterns mm. so thank you very much for sharing that ed or marco anything yeah, no, this, about yourself or the group yeah, if, I, if i can say something yeah this was a lot of fun and because um i'm i'm this will come as a surprise, a bit of a curmudgeon. And so, <laughs> and so, and so having the opportunity to be non curmudgeonry about how I approach things, you know, your questions were, were just 
very simple, very direct, very to the point, just, you know, kind of keep your eye on the ball uh, kind of thing. I, I found that uh, I, I found that very refreshing and in, in that regard, very opening. And I, um, and even though I, I can't draw for others, I kind of know what I wanted to say <laughs> with, my, with my drawing. I mean, it means a lot to me, and it helped me to articulate things that, I, that I've been kind of mulling over and wrestling with, but haven't really come to terms with uh, lately, because this whole idea about um, when are you best as a writer, um, well, it was something I was reflecting on my journal today. We all have journals, I'll show you mine, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Here's mine. <laughs> yeah, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all, all over it. Exactly. And and I was reflecting on that very point. Is and and well, what am I doing with this and where am I going? And when do I do that? Because uh, most of the writing that I do these days tends to be online where I I wish I weren't writing. You know, I would rather be somewhere else. Carolyn said, I like to get away, like a quiet, I don't want a lot of distractions. I'm not a person of background or things like that. I just want to kind of kind of be there and do that. But most of what I I write almost seems like I have to write. It's a response to a post. Uh, Marco can relate to this. He's got things flying at him all the time. You you have to react. And you have to you have to you do that writing. And we don't recognize enough. It took me a long, long time to realize that that's very good practice of writing, but not the practice of writing. It's a, it's a good way, to, you know. So, so we practice a lot without actually getting to the practice kind of thing. It's like we're always in the uh, we're always in the amphitheater with the uh, guy that's uh, dissecting, you know, the corpse on the table other than actually practicing medicine kind of thing. Hmm. Any kind of sensible analogy. That's what I thought. Thank you. I enjoyed this. It was, it was a lot you. of fun. I enjoyed it too. Thank you very much for participating. I really think it's great for me as well. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about you guys. It's very rewarding for me to be able to uh, offer this. Mm -hmm. Marco. Well, to follow on what Ed was just saying about the practice of writing, and, mm -hmm. and maybe to put a finer point on that, there's almost practice for writing and the practice of writing, where the practice of writing is the writing itself. It's actually yeah. doing the thing, yes. saying the That's thing that needs to be said, saying the truth that needs to be mm -hmm. articulated, as Caroline was saying. And I realized coming into this, and now, like, by, you know, through the benefit of the reflection and of the, um, uh, the sort of mingling of each other's voices and, and, and the perspective that that creates, I realized that I have really been longing actually for that space. And I felt that that real, that practice of writing and, yeah. and, and I feel that I just kind of get away from it or it gets away from me and I get tangled in other activities and that I actually become unhappy the, the further I am from that and that there's something about this incarnation, this life and a sense of identity that I, that, that requires me to be in a more intimate and kind of, I don't know, consistent is the right word, but more sort of present relationship with that writing and uh, how hard that is because I also, it, it does imply a relationship to others. And Caroline, like I picked up on that as well, that, as a writer, you re and I don't mean by that as an identity, but in, as somebody who is speaking truth, as she sees it, as a fearless conduit, to, to use Carol, the Caroline's metaphor, um, or seeing every saying everything that you want to get out of your mind to use to use Ed's, it, um, it puts you in relationship with others because you are writing really, you're emptying yourself and you're you're putting something out. So it's going from this inchoate state or this notebook uh, location into a public space. Uh, and I, real, I realize how um, daunting that is uh, and, because it does take a lot out of one. It does, at least for me, it takes a lot out of me when I really am doing it. And it seems to expose me most radically. Uh, and 
I, I want it. And at the same time, uh, I, I feel that I need to be ready for it because it's so, uh, it's such an overwhelming experience actually when, when it's actually happening. Uh, and it's ecstatic and liberating at the same time, but uh, it's, it's not, it's trans it's not normal. It's not part of sort of the fabric of everyday life or average everydayness uh, of, uh, at least in my, in, in my world. You know, I think there may be scenarios, such maybe contexts, even communities uh, or spaces where that kind of, that sort of way of being or the, that transit between states is more supported and more uh, received. And I mean, perhaps that's part of what we're trying to create. Uh, together, um, but it is a distinctive kind of space, and th- there does, I feel, need to be some kind of receptivity and some kind of reciprocity. Again, that feedback loop, that feeling that things are clicking, that there's a, a circulation, uh, see, is all very, very helpful to, to that process. And I know that when I'm too alone, or when I'm too wrapped up in my own thoughts or mind or in my own trance or what have you, uh, it it becomes an enervated state ultimately. Uh, because it's sort of on itself and until it exhausts itself. Whereas in the relationships and in that sort of openness of exposure, but intimacy, I, it, there's a, there's a way that I think the, the writing can grow and can become more, uh, more full and more, more really more joyful. Like uh, I, but that's in my experience. That's been rare. Actually, it's been really rare to to experience that concretely and to really really have that come forth that in that way. Well, thank you all very much. I've learned a great deal. Um, we're we're going to post this, and I'll mm-hmm. be able to look at it again, and maybe I'll be able to uh, go to a, me- a meta level so that I could maybe pick out some patterns, and I would report back to you guys what I. Mm-hmm. Is there a sense you have now, John? Is there, is there just a kind um, of immediate... Well, the big research question I have is, are patterns discovered or are they created? I'm not sure. Um, is there already something there that the question triggers? Or which question or which cluster of questions are the most relevant to that? That's my question as a, as a modeler, because the questions are there. And the syntax I use depends on the content that uh, the open-ended question um, triggers. So whatever that content is, I try to create a sort of uh, intimate kind of language game, you know, because I'm using my voice in a certain way. It's a little hypnotic. It's a little trancey. I slow things down. And you know that the vagus nerve, I think I mentioned that in one of those bubbles, it's a there's this polyvagal theory, it totally fascinates me. Um, but I think the, uh, the vagus nerve is uh, a wandering nerve that goes throughout our body. Start, it starts in the back of our head and it goes through all the viscera and it goes through our spine. Um, but we're, we're starting, it, it triggers the fight, flight, uh, or freeze in our system. Um, but there's also a new... Um, a new development that one researcher, his name is Borges, he's talking about this new uh, social engagement system that's starting to be activated, which has, uh, which transcends that fight, flight, freeze dynamic, which is very reptilian, actually. Reptiles, it's good for reptile to freeze if they're in a threatening situation. It's not good for a mammal to freeze because we tend to drop dead. <laughs> you know, our hearts actually will stop if we're that frightened. So this is a vestige of a, of our previous uh, incarnations or in other species. So I'm finding that very, very fascinating, that old reptile brain. Um, Unless you're a, if we can, a it's, If there's a way that we can transcend and include that, I think we, we would be our vagus system. Um, and, and we know, we know that, that uh, you know, touch and sound and music and face-to-face conversations that are heart connected, these are all, uh, very good for your vagus. And I believe that, I haven't done this research, uh, so I'd have to develop it more, but I, I do believe that the clean language uh, facilitates that kind of whole brain, whole body kind of uh, participation. So, so I'm looking at the third wave of cybernetics I mentioned earlier, and I believe that this is a, like a template for working with that possibility 
um, because we're working at different levels. I think we already we went through those different levels. Uh, when you're at your best, what's your environment? Uh, what are your skills or abilities? What's your behavior? Who are you? Where are you? Who else is involved? Um, all those kinds of levels. Uh, when we start to move from level to level, uh, I believe we start to uh, get a, a kind of intuition that's very generative. Um, otherwise, when we talk about systems theory and hierarchies and networks, it can get pretty abstract. So what I love about this is I believe that uh, with enough practice, you get very intuitive with these abstract concepts become much more embodied in us. So that's my, uh, um, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I feel like there's so much going on here that when I study this video, which I think is one of the wonders actually of our technology is that we can have these kind of events and we can create an archive and we can uh, study any progress that has been made. Um, I also think about what would happen next. We could continue uh, when we have an issue as a community um, or we have an impasse or a dilemma or a paradox. Clean language is a very good tool for exploring those kinds of group dynamics. So I could just sit down with the whoever's in the, who, had, who was ever in that cluster of issues and we could just say, well, what would you like to have happen? And then you could then see, okay, this is this person's agenda, that's that person's agenda. They have an agenda and everyone has an agenda. There's no problem with agendas. It's just often they get uh, buried or obscured. And um, I believe that this is a very good, uh, good way, a good, a good methodology for working with complex systems, whether they're stable or unstable. Um, and um, that's been my experience. I, and I think it also, it's driven for me by aesthetic relationships. I mean, I am turned on by the beauty that I see in people when they start to go to a deeper level. When they, you know, those, those abstract concepts, and then when they start to go into a perceptual space and start to embody some of that, I think that's where um, the magic happens and how we we re-embody ourselves through our language. And um, that's our, that's the blessing and the curse of being a human being, having, having this wonderful language that can so totally distort and generalize and, and make a mess of things as well. So anyway, that's my, um, my mission in life, I guess. And what I love about clean language is that uh, it starts it. that, uh, it starts to, things start to emerge that you could not have predicted. And, and I uh, expect that maybe we could uh, dialogue some more online. And if I pick up on any patterns I think are useful to the group, I would let you guys know. And y'all could comment on that. So it could start to uh, yeah. be a, a manageable kind of complexity. Because if we're, if we're uh, I think chaos is when we try to oversimplify a system. Um, we actually push the system towards chaos. I believe we can um, avoid chaos and the system gets enriched and becomes more complex and learns about itself at another level. But you can't come outside of a system and say, we're going to do make these interventions um, to make this system work. I don't think that level of systems theory, that first level, the second wave, I don't think that kind of works anymore. I think we need to create organizations where everyone gets a chance to express their own metaphor and bring their metaphor. I believe that this is my futurizing here. What, what would that be like for us as a group when we, when we could get to that level where everyone, not only is everyone, where the organization would want to know what the person's metaphors were and how those metaphors were evolving. Because each metaphor, of course, reveals and it conceals. And sometimes metaphors that were useful are no longer useful and need to be dropped. So anyway, that's my big spiel. Uh, I hope this was of use to you guys, and I'm looking forward to uh, future episodes. <laughs> ah, cool. Yeah, all of what you just shared at the end there, I very much resonate with. And um, I love that we're talking about, we're talking about basically a continuous inquiry and an inquiry that in theory is not, um, not tainted with 
the asker's own metaphors. Um, yeah. So to, to the idea of embodying that as a cultural norm in our, in our practices is very appealing to me because um, I don't know what you said about letting, like really inquiring into each other's metaphors and, and letting each other's way of relating to the world be an integral part of the, the web of the whole um, is very resonant to what we're trying to do. I feel like with cosmos. So I yeah, I too. really appreciate that. Yeah. I'll also say one thing I, I noticed is that I, I really enjoyed the process of, of drawing and part of what I enjoyed about it is in almost in dis- contradistinction to what I was saying about wanting to be alone. I kind of liked the background noise actually. And I felt that <laughs> like it sort of, I was in a bit of a trance there as I was, as I was drawing and it's meaningful to me, the, the, you know, the image, I don't know if it'll be so meaningful to, you know, the general public, but I, uh, I noticed that and, and add that to your store of potential meta patterns, I, I guess. <laughs> uh, but for what it's worth, I, I, I found that to be interesting. Uh, and that I also found that it was interesting that I felt free to kind of draw on others' metaphors. Uh, there was a sense that we might be Look perhaps. Up. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> there was a sense that we might be. Cross-fertilizing, that's what I call it. Cross-fertilizing, cross-pollinating, or even creating a a reservoir of of metaphors that that one can draw on to, you know, intuitively, not as a matter of, you know, some kind of master map, but Mm -hmm. really just intuitively because it's uh, the right image or phrase for the occasion. It actually says what you mean to say. Uh, And the fact that it it came into your space through, you know, someone else's writing or mouth, um, their words is uh, it's actually good. It's nice because it, it, what it lets, it lets there be a kind of ref- reflection back where I can, can sort of re present uh, what I've heard, but in, through my own process uh, and let the other know that in the way that I've heard them. Um, but also that like, I'm, I've heard them in my way. So there's, there's both a, a sort of reflection, but also a selfness. I, I, don't, I, I don't know exactly how to, how to articulate this very well, but it's, it's fascinating. part of the weaving. It's yeah, part well, of the I, weaving. Think, uh, I think pattern, um, uh, Gregory Bateson, the great anthropologist, he was married to Margaret Mead. He, he said pattern is a difference that makes a difference. And I think that's a very great definition. And I, I've done this with uh, maybe 15, 20 people. I've done workshops and I'll say, what's learning at your best? And everyone will have a metaphor and they'll all have a picture and they'll all hold it up and show it to the group. Every, no one has the same metaphor. It's always different. And I find that shocking. The same word triggers a totally different response in each person, just as we, as you noticed here. So yet at the same time, even though everyone's metaphor is different, they all can understand the other person's metaphor. So this to me is a very hopeful sign that we can um, actually draw some sort of sustenance from our differences. Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking, and this is talking out loud about um, there's in systems theory, there's a lot of these debates about open and closed systems. And um, I like the idea of open closure because here uh, we were closed because we had, three participants and myself, and I wanted to keep it uh, manageable because I believe we had a good pace and everyone got enough attention, which, of course, you get less attention the more people who are on. Yet I also want to post this so that everyone in our community or even beyond our community has access to it. So it gets the benefit of being uh, of a safe container and also, but it isn't turned into something that gets incestuous, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Where it's uh, we're we're building barriers or, or, or walls around ourselves, so that's why I think the the, the technology here is so um, wonderful because uh, you know we could present this to others as a template and uh, their initiatives, and we can also talk about what's uh, we did writing today, but you could do, when you're communicating at your best, when you're thinking at your best, when you're when you're having sex at your best, <laughs> whatever you want to do at your best, you can use this <laughs> process. And it would be, uh, I think, a very interesting thing to 
to do with a, you know, this group, if we wanted to gather again, or with another group who might want to gather, as long as that appreciation for the open and open closure is sort of uh, honored. Um, because I think with too many people, it just descends into sort of chaos, mm. especially uh, with my uh, skill level as it is. I can handle a large group in person, or I can definitely easily handle one-to-one, um, but it's a, a different thing doing it online because mm-hmm. we do want to keep the rapport and we want to keep the safety. And we also want to let there be enough safety so people can be adventure, adventurous. So anyway, that's my, I just wanted to share that as well. Uh, something that I'm learning as a, as, a, as a modeler and hopefully I'll be able to get up there. Get a little well, bit I, at each time. I thank you, uh, John. That was great. I enjoyed it. Dude, and thank I, you. I think I, there's, I think we. I, I think I learned something too. So cool. I'll be working with it. Yeah. Cool. Ditto. Yeah. Cool. Thumbs up, guys. All thank right. Thank you very much. That's a wrap. Bye. Happy trails. Bye. <laughs>